Hello and welcome to the Cuyamaga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, and of course on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, our volunteers and supporting members, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Cuyamaga Institute is an independent nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution, we take an open approach and invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this Conversation for Exploration. On these weekly Sunday discussions, we've included a full spectrum of topics, from neuroscience, anthropology, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, um, eco-spirituality, ecology, psychology, mythology, shamanism, ritual, roots of theater, deep history, so much more, from the arts to the sciences. We want to invite you to visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free, and as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a supporting member. And we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Cuyamaga Institute. Why is it there's a renewed interest by the government in investigating the concept of UFOs? It's in the news. The Pentagon has opened an office focused exclusively on investigating UFO sightings. The Department of Defense formally released three Navy videos that contain unidentified aerial phenomena. And in 2020, the US uh, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence called for an inquiry into UFOs, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, UAP, as the government prefers to call them. And in early June, NASA joined in. They announced that it's commissioning an independent study on, on the UAPs, the phenomena. Numerous Freedom of Information Act requests have resulted in the release of more than 1,500 pages of the UAP-related materials. So. That's what's happening on the government level. But what about the private sector, the academic sectors? Which brings us to today's guest, Laura. What I appreciate about today's guest is that he is a philosopher at heart, and he brings that perspective, a quest for those big philosophical questions to his work as a theoretical astrophysicist and as an astronomer at Harvard. And it was toward that end that one year ago, uh, Avi Loeb launched the privately funded Galileo Project, named, of course, after that Galileo, Galileo Galilei, whose view through one of the first telescopes and his daring in accurately deducing and declaring what such views meant, that all that we see does not revolve around just our planet and that we do not sit at the center of the universe. This forever altered our understanding of our place within that universe. And Abby's Galileo project holds the promise to do just that once again. He's making an innovative approach for data to answer a key question about our place, and that is, are we alone in the universe? A paradigm shift of major proportions is already underway. It's full steam ahead. We've just deployed the James Webb Space Telescope. It's going to the far reaches. It's not going to the far reaches. It's peering into the far right. reaches a million miles away um, to, to gather up more data on those very questions, origin of the universe, exoplanets. But it's closer to home that Avi is aiming telescopes to pick up signs that perhaps intelligent life from extraterrestrial in, in civilizations has already been here and perhaps left a few clues behind, mm -hmm. whether in the deep past or our present. And you have to ask, if we can send probes far afield, why not other civilizations? Why not other intelligent life? Well, couldn't they have sent one our way? So in his previous visits to us, Avi asked that very question when he detailed a rather curious interstellar object dubbed Oumuamua. It intrigued him. He wrote a book on it. That one came and went rather quickly with some anomalous qualities to it. But there was another object from outside our solar system, and those are, objects are rare. 
Um, this one was an outlier indeed as well. Um, it's now sitting at the bottom of the ocean, and he has plans to retrieve it for closer examination. And as you mentioned, Paul, lots of intriguing data, and I'm sure it's just the tip of the iceberg that our government is recently releasing due to accumulated evidence, due to popular demand um, on the unidentified aerial phenomenon. I guess that's the newest term. I guess they're um, retiring the term UFO. So what are the other gaps that the Galileo Project is gearing up to fill in this wide sweep for evidence to answer that question, are we alone? This definitive answer to this question is going to change everything, will it not? And as Avi says, it's these high-risk ventures. These are the ones with high-stake rewards. Our society does not have time to waste. We need to get our house in order, and by that I mean our worldview as well as our planet. So Avi, welcome back. You certainly have not been wasting time. During this pandemic, you have, in addition to getting the Galileo Project staffed, equipped, and launched, you've written 100 scientific papers, 160 commentaries, and three books, one of which is a bestseller, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth, Congratulations. Uh, you've been busy. Yeah. One <laughs> is the textbook, for... and what's the third book? We want to know what's the third book you've got coming out. Well, thanks for having me. Um, indeed, it was um, a busy time for a good reason. I, I wasn't distracted the way I am uh, often um, when people knock on my door without uh, notification. And during the pandemic, I was, I had all the time available for my creative work. And there is a book um, that I just finished writing and should appear within a year, in June 2023, uh, a continuation to the uh, book Exoterrestrial that discussed a particular object, but now uh, talking about other uh, interstellar objects and uh, the importance for humanity, for the future of humanity, of us thinking differently about this. And you mentioned the Webb telescope. Uh, I should say I was on the... Um, uh, first science advisory committee for that telescope uh, back in 1995. Uh, back then it was called the Next Generation Space Telescope and um, the budget was uh, 10 times smaller. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the one thing um, to keep in mind, there was a celebration of the first images from the Webb Telescope uh, in the White House on uh, July 11th. And uh, while everyone else was looking at the bright images of the galaxies in a galaxy cluster that is magnifying also images of galaxies behind it. To me, it was quite striking if you look at that image, it's called the deep image of the Webb telescope. There are two lessons that you immediately learn from it, which are not often discussed. One is that most of the image is full of darkness. There are these bright islands of galaxies, but there is black in between. Now you might say, okay, well, it's empty. That's not the case, actually. What no. we are seeing as the galaxies, the bright regions of galaxies, are just the tail of the dog. Mm. The dog yeah. is the dark matter that we can't see. That is what dominates gravity. That's what moves the galaxies around at the speeds that they are moving. So in fact, what we can't see is most of the matter. What we see is just the tail of the dog. And mm. we tend to think that what we see is the you know, the most important thing because it's made of the same material as we are made of. That's ordinary matter. In fact, there is five times more so-called dark matter whose nature we don't know. We don't know what most of the stuff in the universe is, which is quite humbling if you think about it. You know, we are made of some material, then we find out that the rest of the universe is made mostly, 80% of it is made of another type of material. We don't know what it is. Okay, that's point number one. The dark regions that we can't see are actually dominating the image. Mm. The second point that I wanted to highlight is, you know, the, the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, uh, when this uh, celebration took place in the White House, he said, that, Mr. President, we are seeing some galaxies from 13 billion years ago. Yeah. Now, this is an unusual statement to be made in the White House, which often uh, revolves around a four year time scale, <laughs> trying to appease uh, politicians yeah. and the public. So think about 13 billion years versus four years. Okay, 
So we are used to thinking very short term. Um, and uh, we also tend to think that we are at the center of the universe. You know, before <laughs> Galileo, we thought that we are at the center of the stage. There yeah. is this cosmic plate taking. Also on. humbling. Yeah. Yeah. And the second thing is, you know, we are not only not situated at the center of the stage, we now know that, you know, we are moving around Back the sun. Water. Yeah. And the sun is moving around the center of the galaxy. And the galaxy is one out of a trillion galaxies in the observable volume of the universe. Clearly, we are not at the center stage. But also, we came to the stage relatively late, you know, just recently, compared to the 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. So how can we even imagine that the cosmic play is about us? <laughs> and, if it's not, and if it's not about us, then let's try and find other actors that yeah. will tell us about it. Yeah. Now, the strange thing is, the government is reporting, discussing. Now it's, in, you know, it, they cannot ignore it because we have so, uh, you may so ask why data. now? Why are they discussing it now? It's because by now we have instruments uh, that are far better than we had even two decades ago. So forget about the old reports about unidentified objects. We now see them with much better instruments that mm -hmm. the government uh, has in its possession and they cannot ignore it. Okay, so the fundamental question the government wants to address is uh, what are they? Uh, you know, there are two possible categories, either natural objects like birds, uh, bugs, uh, whatever, <laughs> or uh, yeah. uh, human-made objects like drones, airplanes, and so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, apparently the government is not convinced that it's neither. They cannot tell the, whether it belongs to an adversary. They cannot tell whether it's natural. And so it could be something else. And uh, here is where the scientific community needs uh, to come to the help of the government. So the government is curious. The public is curious. Guess who is not curious? The, the astronomers, the academic yeah, community yeah. Ridicules, ridicules the subject. There is no federal funding for it. NASA is just starting now to think they established a study uh, a year after the discussion in Congress. You know, back then I approached uh, uh, the head of NASA and the person under him, Thomas Zurbuchen, and I submitted a white paper to do research on the subject, but I didn't get a response. So they are now establishing a committee that will look into the, whether to recommend that they invest some money into it, that it will take a year for them to listen, uh, and then uh, another year for the appropriations of the funds and so forth. We are already doing it with the Galileo project. So mm -hmm. my point is, here is a fundamental question that the public cares about, you know, the government cares about, and that could have huge implications for the future of humanity. Let's figure out the nature of objects that look weird. I mean, we are not just dreaming it up. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, military personnel uh, find these things. Astronomers, you know, out of the three interstellar objects that astronomers discovered over the past decade, by the way, it's completely new frontier. When Carl Sagan was around, uh, nobody knew uh, that uh, there are interstellar objects. We've never, the only three interstellar objects known were discovered over the past eight years. One of which we can talk about that we discovered with my student, uh, the interstellar meteor. So it's only recently that we found objects from outside the solar system. So, you know, when people say, where is everybody? Well, it may uh, well be around us here because we haven't looked here. We just looked for radio signals from far away. And maybe there are, they're already here. Mm. That's why it's uh, so important that you got private funding so you could just go full steam ahead and start. What are you deploying? What is the Galileo project doing? Right. Who so, did you staff it with? How did you, what are yeah. your various? Yeah. So um, uh, about a year and a half ago, I published the book Extraterrestrial, as you mentioned. And uh, uh, a few months later, um, uh, in summer, exactly a year ago, it's summer 2021, a few multi-billionaires showed up in the porch of my home and they, they said that they were inspired by the vision of my book and they provided me with um, by now $3 million to my research funds at Harvard. And uh, back then I contacted NASA and asked whether they wanted to establish a research program on this subject, didn't get a reply. So I said, I'll just establish my own project. I don't, I don't need approval. Um, and um, so by now we have more than a hundred uh, members involved. And in fact, uh, we just uh, completed the assembly of the first telescope system on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory. Yeah. So we will start collecting data next week. 
And uh, this is just to test the system. So it's basically taking a video of the entire sky in optical, infrared, radio, and audio, uh, and then analyzing the data with uh, artificial intelligence algorithms so that we can tell whether we are looking at natural objects like birds, uh, mm -hmm. flies, bugs, uh, or we're looking at uh, human-made objects like drones, airplanes, satellites, rockets, whatever. Uh, and if not, then just like Sherlock Holmes uh, argued, uh, whatever remains must be the truth, you know? And uh, uh, we want to approach it scientifically. The sky is not classified. Government data is classified for a simple reason that it's collected by classified sensors. Mm -hmm. So the government has a missile defense system. It doesn't want adversaries to be aware sure. uh, of the quality of the sensors. Therefore, it classifies the data. And waiting for the government to declassify the data is just is. like wa waiting for Godot, you know, in, this, in Samuel <laughs> Beckett's uh, play. Yeah. You can wait forever. It mm -hmm. will never come. So my point is, rather than waiting, I mean, uh, the sky is not classified. Let's just collect our own data. If we don't do it, nobody else will. So um, that's the underlying principle of the Galileo project. And, uh, you know, it's obviously called after Galileo because he found an answer to a fundamental question by looking through the telescope rather than assuming the answer in advance. So the, the question was, are we at the center of the universe? The answer was no, uh, <laughs> the, the earth is moving around the sun. Now there were philosophers that said, uh, we disagree with you, we will put you in house arrest because we know the answer. Yeah, he paid a price and, for that, yeah. I mean, today he would have been canceled on social media. Uh, and if you were to ask those philosophers whether, you know, if they can design a mission that will reach Mars, they would never get to their destination because they thought that Mars moves around the Earth. So my point is reality is whatever it is, doesn't matter what people say, how many likes you get on Twitter. Um, reality is whatever it is. And putting people in house arrest does not change reality. I mean, the Earth continues to move around the sun. And we want to find the answer through telescopes, not by listening to people's opinions. That's or completely the irrelevant. Yeah. 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 So, um, so you're looking through telescopes. And what is this object, this other meteor? that came right. from outside our solar system. Why does that intrigue you? It's rather like the Oumuamua. You detect a few qualities of it. They, they suggest it could maybe be manufactured, not natural. And so this one at least stayed on Earth. So your right. mission is to retrieve it? What's, what's the plan? Right, so the Galileo project has three branches. One of them is to look at those unidentified aerial phenomena that the government talks about that I mentioned before. The second is to rendezvous with the next Oumuamua, which, I mean, Oumuamua was uh, discovered in 2017. It didn't look like a rock, uh, didn't look like a meteor, uh, didn't look like a comet or an asteroid. It behaved um, differently. Than it behaved differently. It had the, a number of anomalies that I discuss in my book. It was pushed away from the sun without a cometary tail. It had an, a very extreme shape. Anyway, we didn't get enough data on this object. And as a scientist, we would like to find another object like it and get much better data because we cannot chase Oumuamua. It, it flew too fast for us to go after it now. Um, and so um, the, the goal is to rendezvous the next Oumuamua, to come close to it, take a high resolution image of it. And that would resolve the question about its nature, you know, whether it has screws or bolts on its surface, whether you can read off the label made on exoplanet Y. Uh, or whether it's a nitrogen iceberg, hydrogen iceberg, or a dust bunny, like some of my colleagues argued, something that ah. we've never seen before. That was the mainstream approach to say, no, it's natural, but it's a natural object of a type that we've never seen before. Okay, that was the alternative to an artificial or origin. So uh, we have a dating app. Uh, this, in order to have a date with uh, the next Tomoma, we need a dating <laughs> app. And the dating app is... Um, uh, the, the forthcoming telescope uh, called the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile that mm. will start operations in a year. And it will basically, uh, uh, it has a camera of 3.2 billion pixels and monitors the southern sky every four days. So oh. it will identify an Oumuamua-like object based on our estimates every few months. And then that will be the dating app. 
And most of the time we will swipe to the left, uh, but every now and then we might say, oh, this is a very interesting object that came from outside the solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, are, we might be willing to invest more than a billion dollars in dating it, coming close to it. So that's uh, the, the design of the space mission is a second branch of the Galileo project. We are, we are yeah. working on it now. And the third, the third one is related to what you mentioned, um, the, uh, this meteor that uh, uh, was identified by government's uh, missile warning system back in uh, 2014 on August 1st. Um, there was uh, an object roughly the size of a watermelon uh, that moved uh, very fast, uh, was uh, discovered by uh, government uh, satellites at, um, and uh, as it uh, basically burned in the atmosphere as a result of the friction with the air in the lower atmosphere, it was moving at 45 uh, kilometers per second at the time and, and only exploded in the lower atmosphere. And um, so we um, calculated with my student that it must have arrived from outside the solar system because it was moving too fast to be bound to the sun. And uh, ah. uh, our, we submitted a paper for publications publication, but our colleagues were arguing, we don't believe the US government. Uh, they didn't release the, the uncertainties in the data. And so um, it took me three years to uh, ex uh, correspond with people uh, behind the national security fence. And uh, eventually there was a letter written by the US Space Command under the Department of Defense to NASA confirming that indeed this object came from outside the solar system. It's interstellar um, mm -hmm. uh, at the 99.999% confidence. So that uh, validates that indeed the measurement was accurate enough. Yeah. And, and then the government also released uh, the light curve, the, um, the light uh, that was emitted during the explosion of this meteor that released about a few percent of the Hiroshima bomb energy when it oh. exploded in the lower earth uh, near Papua New Guinea, about 100 miles off the coast of Papua New Guinea. That's where it landed. And so uh, based on the light curve and the fact that it burned only in the lower atmosphere that is very dense, we could tell that this uh, meteor uh, had a very high material strength, a much tougher Stronger than, than iron, iron, actually. Yeah. So that meant that it's an outlier because only 5% of the space rocks that mm -hmm. uh, are colliding with Earth are mm -hmm. made of iron, are iron meteorites. And you have to think about the Earth as a, basically a fishing net that is yeah. just colliding with objects along its path around the sun, okay? so. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why we can detect, in principle, uh, uh, smaller objects because they burn up in the Earth's atmosphere and uh, we don't need uh, to see them as a result of the reflection of sunlight like we did in the case of Oumuamua. Here, the object burns up, generates its own light from the friction with the air, so we can see smaller objects, and in this case, the size of a watermelon. Um, and this is the first object that came from outside the solar system that we identified as a meteor uh, burning up in the Isn't Earth, colliding that, with the Earth. Due to its rarity, reason enough to want to go retrieve it, whether yeah. it's manufactured or natural. I mean, that alone would be reason enough. Um, how deep is 100 miles off the coast of New Guinea? Is it possible? Can you send a sub down there and grab some of it? I mean, yeah, so it's uh, it's about a mile. Uh, the ocean is about a mile deep. Um, we we are so we are planning right now an expedition as part of the Galileo project to go there. Um, the, it will cost about a uh, one and a half million dollars. I, I already received a donation for half a million. Wow. So uh, as soon as we get the, another million, uh, we will go for it. Uh, we have a team of uh, experts that um, are familiar with the ocean and. The, we will use a sled uh, with a, a, mag a magnet that uh, will collect the fragments by scooping the ocean floor. Uh, so basically we know the region where it landed and when it exploded, it, fra uh, it, it distributed fragments across uh, a region that we know where it is. And we will just try to scoop the ocean floor. And when once we collect the fragments, we could examine their composition. So yeah. we can tell the difference between a rock, uh, an iron meteorite, or an alloy, 
you know, some, some uh, material, material that uh, resembles what we use for spacecraft. And uh, that would be quite amazing to <laughs> figure out. Uh, you know, it's the first time that humanity will put its hands on material from an object that came from outside the solar system. You know, we can send the uh, mm -hmm. spacecraft to other stars, but it would take uh, millions of years to reach them. And here is an object that did take already those millions of years to reach us. So uh, it saves us the time. Uh, you know, humans did not exist on Earth millions of years ago. So just think how long is that journey since humans appeared on Earth? Um, and so um, it would be really interesting to check whether it's a rock or perhaps it's a, a spacecraft like we launched out of the solar system. You know, we, we sent five spacecraft so far. The last one was New Horizons and it's it will take another uh, 100,000 years for it to leave the solar system uh, just in, 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 a in some random direction and imagine it colliding with another planet, uh, mm -hmm. they would consider it a meteor. So uh, we could uh, perhaps uh, quote some interesting fish in our fishing net. Why don't you get James Cameron on onto this project? Because if he can go get, the, you know, retrieve the Titanic, why not this? Oh, yeah. right? right? And make a film out of it. I mean, he would do well with it. Yeah, yeah. We are, we already have a, a filming crew um, as part of the team, but uh, yeah, there is a, um, an attempt to reach uh, Jim Cameron. He is currently finishing uh, uh, his second uh, version of Avatar. Uh, but um, he would be a, an ideal partner. And um, uh, but um, for now, we, I'm trying to um, seek the, the funding that we need because uh, pretty much we know what what instruments we want to use. And uh, it's just a question of funding at the moment. Yeah. So uh, what are the other ways in which you're gathering up evidence? So um, other than uh, planning a space uh, mission to rendezvous Oumuamua and uh, an expedition to scoop the ocean floor near yeah. Papua New Guinea. By the way, the third interstellar object that you mentioned is natural. You have no question about that. You do not think that oh, that's... Oh, yeah. So there are three, um, three interstellar objects discovered over the past eight years. So the first one was the one we discovered with my student, 2014, this interstellar meteor that the government confirmed. Um, and the second was Oumuamua that I wrote the book uh, Extraterrestrial about. Uh, that was 2017 when it was discovered by a telescope in Hawaii. Uh, by the way, the telescope was not looking for interstellar objects. It was looking for objects that come close to Earth. That was the, that's the mission of this telescope PanStars in Hawaii. Uh, it was funded by the US government to identify near Earth objects because Congress tasked NASA back in 2005 to identify 90% uh, of all uh, objects bigger than the size of a football field that may wow. cross the path of Earth. And so as part of that, they constructed the PanStar Survey Telescope to look for such object. And then the telescope software said, here is an object that comes close to Earth. And um, mm -hmm. that was Oumuamua. And then it turns out when they analyzed the, the path of this object, they realized, oh, it moves too fast to be bound to the sun. They were not looking for such things. They just found it by chance. So that was 2017. And then in 2019, an amateur astronomer uh, uh, called the Gennady Borisov found uh, a comet that uh, also came from outside the solar system that was clearly a comet. It had a cometary tail, resembled the comets that we see in the solar system. So it was clearly natural. And uh, I was asked, uh, so first of all, you realize two out of the three interstellar objects are outliers, mm -hmm. the meteor yeah, and the Oumuamua. Yeah. So yeah. it already tells us something that, you know, we better not assume that we know the answer before we check more data on objects that come from outside. Uh, I mean, it's sort of like finding objects in your backyard that came from yeah. the street. You know, you can find them easily because they don't resemble the objects that are in your backyard because they came from the street. They look different. So in, the, in much the same way, we can learn about our street, the cosmic street, by looking at the objects uh -huh. that enter the solar system. And then the third one did look like 
uh, a comet that we are familiar with. So people ask me, doesn't that convince you that Oumuamua was also natural? The fact that the third one, Borisov, appeared to be natural? And I said, well, if you are walking on the beach and you find the, uh, a plastic bottle, and after that you find a rock, it doesn't make the plastic bottle a rock. <laughs> you know? In fact, it makes the plastic bottle more unique because it doesn't look like a rock. Well, as, as our friend Tony Hall um, notes, in theoretical physics, you really have so few opportunities to touch what you study. And so here you've got something sitting at the bottom of the ocean. You can actually go touch it and look at it through the microscope. That's pretty exciting. It right is there. exciting. And you know the way I approach uh, science is like a kid. And um, because I don't want you know, I don't want to be swayed by my ego in the sense that, you know, scientists very often are attached to their ego. That's why there is this concept of an expert. An expert is a person who can explain, tries to explain everything based on past knowledge. Okay, but suppose you find something new that you've never seen before, then experts are the obstacle to new knowledge because they try to pretend that they know the answer in advance. They try to brush it under the rug because it threatens their expertise to admit that there is something they didn't know, okay? Exactly so that's what why did if, Galileo. That, that's uh, why uh, those people that studied for decades objects in the sky from the solar system that studied rocks in the form of uh, asteroids or comets, they would say any object in the sky must be a rock, you know, like, and it, it could be a rock made of nitrogen or hydrogen. Just don't, Tell me that it's something else. It must be natural. And even if it's not, if it's uh, something that we've never seen before, that's much more plausible than anything else. And, you know, that protects their expertise. expertise. And to me, it's the same as a cave dweller finding a cell phone, yeah. and arguing that the cell phone must be a rock because the cave dweller is used to playing with rocks. And of course, uh, the only way to find out is by getting better data. If the cave dweller presses a button and realizes that this rock actually records his voice and takes a picture of him, yeah. then obviously it's not a rock. Okay. So I think that eventually when we have good enough data, it will be inescapable. The point is you can still live in your fantasy world uh, by not collecting the data, by arguing it must be natural, forget about it, let's move on. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is the best way to protect your expertise. I want to approach it like a kid saying, oh, here is something unusual. Let's find, find out what is it. And the best way that the, you, know, you can learn is by putting your hands on it. That's what the kid does. A kid wants to touch everything. Why? Because it gives more data. Now, if an adult looks at an object from a distance and says, oh, I know what it is, then the adult never tries to check. You know, and that is, there is a risk here because you can never find surprises, whereas a child very often finds surprises. So there is an advantage to maintaining childhood curiosity. And Absolutely. that's the reason I like uh, working with young people mm -hmm. that are not too attached to their ego, that yeah. are open-minded, that are not uh, pretending to know more than they actually know. Right. So yeah. you were just describing exactly Galileo's position versus the church and the orthodoxy. Are you not? So your project is so well named. You also described, and, and what encouragement do you get to young people? Because to jump on board, this question, are we alone, seems fraught with career obstruction, right? I mean, it's a dangerous position to take academic-wise. You, you're tenured at Harvard, which is even a rare achievement. So what do you tell your students about why, you know, you compare it to the stock market, high risk, high reward. We got to at least invest some of our portfolio in those key questions and those risky ventures. Yeah. How do you describe it? Yeah, so first uh, I should say a month ago, um, uh, some members of the Galileo team visited the backyard of my home. Uh, we were celebrating the assembly of the first telescope system. Uh, and among them were young students, you know, that are in their 20s. Okay. And uh, so it was interesting to listen to that because uh, uh, the senior people uh, around, you know, there were about uh, a dozen people. 
um, the senior people were saying, oh, we have to be careful because of the history, because of this and that being said. And I said, uh, at some point I said, okay, let's, let's listen to the young people. So I asked the young people, are you worried about working on this subject? What do you think about working on this subject? And the young students said, it's fascinating. It's, it's exciting. I love it. And I said, okay. So I asked the, the senior people not uh, to continue the discussion on, on their scars from the past because, yeah. uh, you know, uh, suppose we collect data and we find something new. You know, right. the worst thing that can happen is not collecting the data because of the fear from what other people might say. Right. And uh, fortunately, I can report that the young people do not have that uh, uh, baggage. And uh, I think that's uh, the only way by which we will be surprised and, and find something new. And I should say that, uh, you know, very often the adults in the room argue uh, they quote Carl Sagan, who said, uh, extraordinary uh, claims require extraordinary evidence. And my point is, extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. If, yeah. you decide, <laughs> if you decide not to fund the search, then you can justify yourself for not having extraordinary evidence and never find anything. That's exactly what the philosophers did during the time of Galileo. They said, we don't want to look through your telescope. They didn't even have to, to fund the, the telescope. They just had to put their eyes through the lens and look out. And they right. said, we don't want. Now, why? Because that could potentially change their view. So if you say, I don't have extraordinary evidence, like these philosophers said, for the fact that we are not at the center of the universe, I don't have that evidence. And then not only that you are not funding it, you are not willing to look through an existing instrument to see that you are wrong, then obviously you will continue to think that you're right. And you can be popular within the church at the time, you can be popular within the public, and you can put Galileo in house arrest so that nobody would listen to him. You can ridicule the subject nowadays on social media, you can decide among your peers that it's not worth putting the money into. And once again, you are keeping yourself ignorant this way. Right. But that doesn't prove that you're right because reality is whatever it is. The earth didn't stop moving around the sun as a result of the treatment of Galileo. So my point is how come four centuries later we live in the same kind of reality where the government says this is a subject worth studying, including yeah. the head of NASA, Bill Nelson, he said that. And uh, moreover, we have these astronomical uh, data that indicate that the first interstellar objects are unusual. So now I don't see it like the stock market. I see it more like, um, you know, there is this poem by Robert Frost that talks about taking the road not taken. Yeah. Okay? And true. he said that that made all the difference for him, taking the road not taken. Yeah. For me, the benefit as a scientist is that if you take the road not taken, you might find low hanging fruit because nobody took that uh, route, uh, you know, yeah, nobody took that. On the scene. Yeah. So there might be some low hanging fruit because nobody picked it up. Nobody took that. So I, as a scientist, there is a chance that once we start collecting data, just because people ridiculed it, because didn't take it seriously, because they never pursued a scientific uh, project along this path, that's why nobody realized that the, there is low hanging fruit there. And why you can write yeah. a bestseller about this. Um, so by the time these 20 year olds get to their mid, their mid career, these old dinosaurs are going to be gone, are they not? These 20 year olds are going to be the next gen that are going to set right. the stage and say, of course, mm -hmm. of course, we're not alone. Yeah, look and deep field Hubble telescope images. Look at what the James Webb is bringing in. Look at the universe. It is replete with opportunity here. Look at the search for exoplanets. How could we possibly be the only one in this infinite? Right. Yeah, I think it will become obvious. But if you look, for example, I mean, it happened many times over in the history of science. And uh, let's take the example of dark matter in, in, yeah. in the study of the universe. You know, we know now that. Uh, 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 four fifths of the matter in the universe are, you know, a different substance than the substance we find in the solar system. We, we call it dark matter just to represent our ignorance. Back in 1933, Fritz Zwicky, he was a, a, an observer at Caltech, 
uh, realized that dark matter must exist based on the motion of galaxies in clusters of galaxies. And he realized that without additional matter than the matter we see, they would fly apart. Okay, so there is something holding them gravitationally and that there must be some additional matter there. So he argued for dark matter. That was 1933. Wow. Nin 1973, four decades later, a, a young astronomer named Jerry Osreker, who became around that time the director of the Princeton University Observatory, gave a lecture, a colloquium at Caltech, the same uh, uh, organization that uh, uh, hosted um, uh, Fritz Wicke, you know, that, that had the Fritz Wicke as, as, as a faculty there. So in the same place, he gave a talk about uh, additional evidence for dark matter based on galaxies, uh, based on work that he did with Jim Peebles, who won the Nobel Prize just a few years ago. And, uh, and he was ridiculed. Basically, the audience of Caltech professors, senior experts in the study of the universe, experts of the universe argued, this is ridiculous. Uh, the matter in the universe is the visible matter. We don't want to listen to the uh, arguments. It's completely you know, absurd to argue that there is dark matter. That is 1973, four decades after Zwicky first discussed it. Mm -hmm. Now, a decade later, the evidence mounted eventually if you ask young astronomers now, they say, oh, this, of course. Ah, yes. How can anyone dispute that? Obviously, there is dark matter. It's, big. it's the orthodoxy now. If you try to uh, say there is no dark matter, you are regarded as a complete uh, outlier, you know? And so right now, it's the folklore. Everyone says dark matter, dark matter. We just don't know what it is, okay? I'm just saying for the first 40 years, mm -hmm. you know, um, so denied. altogether, the subject existed for 90 years. Out of those 90 years, since we knew about dark matter in the universe, half of the time, the astronomers ridiculed it. And the second half, it became the orthodoxy. And if you see that on a subject like dark matter, the composition of the universe, it might very well describe also the existence of intelligent you know, beings out there uh, as well. So the subject may be ridiculed for a while, but then once there is more and more evidence, eventually it will become part of the folklore and everyone would say, of course, why would <laughs> anyone think anything else? And by the way, they would not even give credit to those who, uh, who uh, first, uh, unraveled yeah. the evidence. They would say, oh yeah, that was discussed a century ago already. So there's nothing <laughs> really about And that is the way, I, I mean, I'm just describing to you the, uh, on many frontiers, including exoplanets. Uh, uh, I remember when I started astrophysics about 40 years ago, it was um, the, the exoplanets, uh, planets outside the solar system were very speculative subject. And people were arguing, how would you know if any other star has planets like the sun, you know that? And, and there was a lot of pushback when people reported about potential evidence. And now, of course, uh, half of the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly the same separation. Not, on, not only that uh, stars have planets, but what we find in the solar system is not uh, extremely un unusual. You know, it's quite common. And uh, you see that in that context, you see in cosmology, in many other contexts, that uh, there is a huge resistance as if it must be wrong to start with on anything new because the experts want to maintain their view of the past. That was true of quantum mechanics, by the way. Uh, you know, 120 years ago, um, there was uh, Michelson, a very famous physicist, said, uh, uh, you know, pretty much physics is done. He gave a, a speech at the, in Chicago, at the University of Chicago yeah. uh, around uh, 1900 and said, uh, uh, physics is done. And the only, the only thing that remains is to figure out uh, measurements or the fundamental constants of nature to the sixth decimal point. That's right. the only task left to measure things very precisely. That's what yes. he said. So anyway, uh, he was saying nothing new in physics uh, next. And then uh, five years later, Albert Einstein came with relativity. And then uh, 20 years later, quantum mechanics came to the scene and that revi revolutionized the way we think about physics. So you think about one of the most prominent physicists at the time giving a lecture in the inauguration of a laboratory in Chicago, the University of Chicago, very, you know, he was very proud of himself as an expert in physics, prominent 
physicists saying those things. And then just the two decades later, every, you know, everything was changed in physics, completely changed. Like quantum mechanics is not classical physics, it's completely different. And now all the gadgets that we use are based on quantum mechanics. Mm. My point is the, this hubris, this arrogance of people claiming they know much more than they actually know is very typical. And uh, unfortunately it uh, delays the progress of science. And to see the scientific community uh, arguing against the study of new frontiers while trying to insist on measuring things to the second, third, and fourth decimal point as the worth, you know, the thing that is worth investing billions of dollars in rather than trying to expand our knowledge. You know, that's very frustrating, I must say, because you know, I would think that given this history that I described in several examples, we would learn the lesson. You would but think. We haven't learned it. I think it's part of human nature to be arrogant. I think that, yeah. Right. Well, there's that, that process from the fringe to the mainstream, and thank you for helping push it forward. So, uh, just want to ask about the government's reports, what you find interesting in that data that was released, and then we're going to open it up to questions and comments. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the government, most of the interesting data is classified, as I mentioned. Right. And they had a, so in the latest congressional hearing, which was the first in 50 years, um, they just showed us, uh, you know, openly some uh, cell phone video that is really very fuzzy and uh, uh, low quality. And I, they had a, a classified session afterwards in which I'm sure they had much higher quality data. So that's the frustrating part. As I said, okay. government keeps uh, the classified data close to their chest. And I'm sure that they won't waste 90 minutes of the Congress time discussing this subject unless the classified data was convincing. The unclassified data, the, the data that was released is not really good quality. Now the government has to attend to all reports, even if they are low quality reports because they have to worry about national security, they have to worry about the safety of their military personnel. But for a scientist like myself, what matters is a single object. I don't care if it's a mixed bag, if 99% of all the objects found are natural or human made. If only one object, even if only one is of extraterrestrial origin, that would change the future of humanity. So the role of a scientist is to get excellent data, exceptional data on one object, focus on the high quality data, yeah and not waste time on low quality data. And from the point of view of the government, I should say just a week ago, I mean, so there are lots of things that happened, uh, including NASA establishing this study a month ago. And a week ago, there was uh, new legislation put forward um, that talks about um, uh, protecting people who report uh, about the unidentified objects. That's important to remove the stigma. There was also uh, uh, the DOD uh, talking about uh, assembling data on objects that uh, are in uh, uh, multimedia. In other words, they go into the water and then come out of the water into yeah. the air. And why would they talk about that? That's quite unusual. I've never heard of human-made technologies that can go into the water, come out of the water in uh, extreme speed and, and acceleration. And apparently they have some data that indicates that because otherwise they would not explicitly mention that. They mentioned it a week ago in a, a establishing a new um, uh, entity within the Department of Defense that lo we look into data on such objects. Mm -hmm. um, Tony's making a lot of interesting comments in the chat room. Tony, do you want to pose those as, as your questions and comments? Yeah, sure. I, I, I can. Uh... Comment, Avi, I, I really like what you're saying. Uh, there are so many things that, that could be looked at. One of the things I wonder about, if meteorites have been or could be extraterrestrial material of uh, which contain information, is there anything to be learned by a re-examination of collections of meteorites? Well, that's an excellent um, question. The only issue is that there are a thousand times more rocks that uh, come from within the solar system of this size of a watermelon or so, but based on our estimates. Yes. I mean, we can estimate given this interstellar meteor, the, the uh, uh, you know, we know the trajectory of the Earth. The Earth is just a fishing net that collects things along its path. So we can estimate uh, how many such objects 
exist from outside the solar system versus those rocks that are from the solar system. And it's roughly a factor of a thousand, a thousand times more rocks from the solar system that size. The size. I know. Uh, so yeah. that means that you need to go through a thousand rocks if you don't know which one came from outside the solar system. Now, uh, the way to know if it came from outside is either by the speed, if it moved very fast, like this one that we identified, for that you need to catch, you know, mm -hmm. to, to observe the fireball of the meteor in real time and tell that it's moving very fast. That's what happened in the 2014 uh, meteor data. You know, we, we know that it moved uh, very fast. That's why we, uh, we, we, we are looking into it. Uh, the second is, of course, from the composition. So my point is, you're right. I mean, if, if we can examine thousands of uh, meteors, we might find one of them you know, or a few of them that have composition that does not belong to the solar system. And that's worth looking into. Mm -hmm. uh, just a question. You talked about, about orbit and the estimate you and your students have made about the uh, 45 kilometer per, per second uh, velocity. Uh, there has been for well over a century the American Meteor Society. I think it's arcane now, but there were observers looking at um, falls of significance, uh, plot, literally plotting the paths, and I think there might be some information, calculating orbits, by the way, I think there might be information there, uh, particularly when they're correlated with finds, uh, finds of significant meteors. Right, and it right. Might be, it might be fun if, if you saw the velocity, just like you did, from, from existing data. And of course, now we have other, other things, pan stars and other things that can, can, can do that and other all sky cameras. Uh, if we could go and, uh, and pick on a sample of these, this would be nice. Also, is there uh, an identification, some kind of simple litmus test that can be done rather than destructively destroying the meteor in the, the Hayden Planetarium or something like that? Uh, if, if there's something that we could do very easily to say, hey, there's something going on interesting, I, I think that would be maybe worth looking at. Is there anything right. that would be carried by by such an object that would not be carried by a meteor, meteorite in our own uh, solar system? Yeah, so, so first, with respect to the surveys of the past, you're right. Uh, unfortunately, many of these surveys do not have um, uh, good enough um, uh, uh, measurements to uh, guarantee that uh, fast moving objects are indeed fast moving. And, uh, but but uh, we are looking into other uh, data sets. And the other thing is that uh, interstellar dust was found before. I mean, these are just dust particles, uh, micron size that came from outside the solar system. They penetrate through the heliosphere, the, you know, they enter the solar system, but these are tiny, you know, uh, tiny fragments, uh, dust particles, even though they come from the interstellar medium, they are unlikely to be technological in origin. They are most likely to be dust. But we know that the interstellar medium has dust. So what we are really interested in are objects that are big enough to have instrumentation or to be uh, candidates for artificial in origin. And um, so, uh, uh, I should say uh, there are uh, dust particles that definitely move fast enough, uh, but we don't care so much about them. Now, uh, in principle, it's possible to tell the composition of uh, an object without uh, destroying much of it. You know, we, you can take a very small, I mean, just a few grams uh, are sufficient uh, sure. either to do X-ray spectroscopy or uh, some chemical analysis and figure out the composition. And uh, it's just uh, that this was never done in a methodical way over a very large sample of meteors because everyone assumes that they're from the solar system. And, you know, I think it's worth checking. Now, in the case of this meteor, we know that it moved very fast. We know that it was tougher than iron. That's what make it, makes it intriguing for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, one thing that you, you uh, you mentioned that, that the public uh, mood is changing, and Laura has been building that that story as well. Uh, I was at the uh, Astronomical Telescope Conference in Montreal last week, uh, participating and giving papers there. Um, but one of the themes that seemed to come up over and over again was the importance of public support. Mm. And uh, you may not realize that 11 years ago, the Webb Telescope was almost canceled. I know. This, was, this was saved by, by public support. So, uh, so it's a, 
and, and that would have had huge implications if it was canceled for any future large observatories uh, you know, in the foreseeable future. But now um, there are changes happening. People are more receptive. Yeah. And if we can get, if we can reach um, the generation that's coming up, after all, the uh, the uh, uh, the IROUV telescope is going to be blown by a whole other generation than, than, than's around now. I'm putting my two cents in on how it should be done, but I'm not going to be the person to do it. But but uh, the mission is being considered right now. Early thinking is happening. If we can mm. open doors. Mm. Yeah. I should say, you know, over the past, uh, since my book appeared, I, I had about 1600 interviews and, uh, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, so not only uh, that uh, I realized the public uh, resonates with the message, there are also very wealthy individuals that resonate with the message and it does that academic community is late to the party. That's my, my point. And, um, and, and you ask yourself, why? How can that be the case? Because the whole idea of the tenure system is to examine the unknown and try to take risks. And, uh, you know, we don't know what the dark matter is. We invested billions of dollars trying to, to look at particular yeah. candidates. Why is that more legitimate than searching for objects in our solar system? You know, and uh, it's just really strange uh, to me. Uh, the lack of op open-mindedness, and not only that, hostility to the subject, when the public as a whole is very supportive. I mean, I, I get every day, I get uh, tens of emails from people who are really excited about it, that want to join the Galileo project, that want to be involved, uh, you know, and it's clear to me that um, there is a great potential to the subject. It's just very strange that the reception, and as I should tell you the most, uh, uh, surprising fact is the SETI community. You would yeah. think they would say, great, there is a new kid on our block that uh, tries to uh, pursue a similar task, although not the same approach as we took, which is to listen to radio signals. By the way, listening to radio signals is just like trying to have a phone conversation. You need a counterpart to be active when you're listening. And my yes. point is that maybe most civilizations that ever existed are dead by now, but they still sent out equipment that we can find. So I'm calling it archaeology, uh, extraterrestrial space archaeology. And uh, my, in my view, that was never pursued. And that's complementary to the SETI approach, the traditional. But nevertheless, there is a huge amount of hostility. You know, the SETI people are uh, not allowing. Let me give you a simple example. A year ago, there was a committee established by the SETI community to basically decide that any uh, talk about unidentified objects uh, should not be allowed in conferences of, on SETI. Mm -hmm. So you ask yourself, well, how is that possible? Well, well, SETI, <laughs> yeah, SETI, SETI, SETI is, is vulnerable and SETI is addressing limited funding sources. And if you come in with new, very compelling ways to look at things, these yeah. these monies are not going to go to SETI. The they're, going to, they're, they're going to start losing on it. So there is. Yeah, a, but what you are talking about is politics. You see, I'm a kid. Think of me as a kid. I don't care about this politics. I just <laughs> so, well, they well, were well, adapting. Well, we love about you, yeah. Avi. Yeah, they yeah, were the, the, world the, work, the world works on, on, on these things. So I know, yeah. I know. But if you think about the the genuine curiosity to figure out if we are the smarter kid on the block, okay, to figure out if we are alone or not, that yeah. should overcome all other desires to get funding from NASA or something, they should say, okay, well, let's join forces. You know, that's a new approach. If they really <laughs> care about the a, question. A, a, a question I have, of course, when I, I, when I was in graduate school, one of the things I did in my fellowship was to run the student observatory. And this was at the time when Chariots of the Gods came out, Eric von Donegan. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and this was hugely controversial. And science was called upon to answer that. And of course, he said many things that were just not factual, which made it pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But he did ask some good questions too. I, I have to admit that. Uh, so that By the was way, he. He he invited me to a podcast with him, which I mean I I'm willing yeah. to speak to anyone. Uh, I have no issues, and he was fascinated by the science. Now, the way I pursue it is a scientific project. You know, we, we will just be guided by data. We are not, uh, yeah. you know, in his case, he was making claims that are not. Uh, uh, possible to confirm scientifically, you know, at this point, because we just don't have sufficient historical data. But right. it was intriguing. He or, was or raising. Which we, 
yeah. we knew, or which we knew were, were wrong. He said there yeah. was no, no glass in ancient Egypt, and we know that that mummies had glass eyes, and we even know right. how they were polished. No, yeah. I mean, uh, okay. So here is the important point that people, for example, a thousand years ago, argued that the human body has a soul. Okay, they said, yeah. therefore, operations should be banned. You shouldn't dissect the human body because you may hurt the soul by oh, opening up the body. So mm -hmm. that was a real debate. Okay, and imagine if modern science would say, forget about it. It's a controversial subject. People are saying the human body has, we don't want to open the human body. Then where would modern medicine be? We would have no mRNA vaccines. We would never understand how the organs of the human body mm -hmm. operate. And right. my point is, even if people make wrong statements about the, about the human body, it doesn't make the subject not worthwhile pursuing scientifically. Thank so you. people can say nonsense about anything. I don't care about it. I just want to approach it scientifically. And I think yeah. if we give up on subjects that other people say nonsense about, then we would never make progress. Just because someone else says nonsense about a subject should prevent me from addressing it scientifically, that's ridiculous. Well, I have to agree with you on that totally. Uh, well, we have to we have to, be, we have to be careful of some things. For example, we've not established that our solar system is typical yet. Uh, we know a lot. We, we have over five thousand exoplanets for sure. Other solar systems that we're seeing do not look like ours. Why? Yeah. Probably observational selection. The methods we use to detect solar systems do not favor seeing an Earth-like solar system. Well, uh, that's true. I mean, because the Earth is a small planet, but there is a paper. No, not, not, uh, not, not, not just that the Earth is a small planet, but the distribution of planets where you have large planets in tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but there, there was a scientific paper analyzing the, the Kepler data, the Kepler satellite data. And the statistics that was uh, concluded in that paper was that uh, about half plus or minus 25% uh, of all stars like the Sun have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly the same separation. This is a scientific wow. paper analyzing the data from Kepler. Now, I agree with you that we can't easily observe with the Kepler satellite. We, we didn't even observe uh, a single system that definitely has an Earth-like planet at the right separation. But the yeah, point and, is- and, and it's not designed to see Earth-like yeah. separations from, from its the yeah. sun. But that's, but that's so, the so, statistical- so it, can't, it can't do that, you know, it's, it's not a surprise we're well, not finding Here's it. another point. We're just seeing the near region to yeah. our planet. That's all we can see for exoplanets. Look at the deep field. How do we know that uh, our region of the cosmos is like every other region? No, right? no, but the, the other point to keep in mind, very important point is we focus on the habitable zone around the star. That's the zone where the Earth is around the sun, okay? which. By the way, the Earth naturally would freeze. Uh, it's just at the edge of the habitable zone. It would freeze. It's because of the, uh, it has a, uh, an atmosphere that it has this uh, warming effect that keeps it warmer than it should be based on the distance from the sun. But the point is that this may not be the most common place where you find life because uh, it's possible that there are yeah. objects that are frozen on their surface that have ice on the surface and under the ice there is liquid water where life exists. We know of such objects in the solar system, for example, uh, Enceladus or Europa. These are moons of, mm -hmm. okay, of other planets. And we see geysers coming from cracks in the ice. So they have ice on the surface. Now, the fundamental question is, are there any fish swimming in the water under the ice? Yeah. We don't know. We don't know. So one way to find out is to fly through these geysers, these streams of uh, water vapor and see. collect but already we know um, that uh, they contain very complex molecules, but whether they have life under the ice or not is not known. And if indeed we find that there is evidence for at least primitive life under the, the ice, that means that life is very ubiquitous, not just in the habitable zone of stars like the Look sun. Look at the extremophiles yeah. in our deep sea vents, right? No, but it could be very far away. What I'm saying is you don't need to be at the same location. You can yeah. be very far from a star and still, still have life. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, no, Tony. I, I, Good point. Yeah, I would, yeah. I would agree. Fascinating Tony, we look forward to the 21st with you and Diana giving yeah, us we'll the look, latest look on the, the James Webb images. Fantastic. That will Absolutely. Be fun. Yeah. yeah. And, and, Avi, and coming back, Avi, to what you were talking about, and that's the ability to at least have discussions, to have an open forum uh, uh, of research and conversation rather than it being closed 
this kind of culture, ca cancer culture co concept of we don't allow it even to go there, like you're saying from the field of from the field of science, but just even the general public as well. And that's what we think with this program is that can we have conversations? We don't necessarily want to agree with everybody we interview. That would be terribly uninteresting to us. We want to talk to people that are pushing the envelope, that are asking questions that we they want to dare challenge our, our to be challenged. Worldview, right. And so that's, right? We don't have yeah. it all right. No, right. And so while we, won't, we, don't, we want to stay away from stuff that's just totally speculative with nothing at its foundation, there has to be something there for us to at least have the discussion to see. We should stuff. be able to ask oh, the question. So so yeah. as a point, from the point of view of a scientist, I, sh I should just say uh, the most important guiding principle for me is it's not a matter of us discussing it, of how many likes I get on social media and so forth. Uh, <laughs> we are supposed to be guided by data. Okay, that's what data. guides science, evidence. Okay, so I'm not claiming one way or another. I'm just saying let's collect the data. Let's collect yes, the evidence. Ask the question. And why, why am I, I saying that? I'm not saying it because I woke up in the morning and I said, well, this would be a nice thing for us to look into. I, the reason I did that is because in 2017, there was the first interstellar object this, uh, reported and uh, it looked weird. Okay, And then we found this meteor that looks weird. And I say, you know, the first two interstellar objects look weird. Let's just look into that. Now, around mm. the same time, the government talks about objects that they cannot identify. And I say, let's look into that as well. So my point is, it's not a matter of fantasy or conviction or uh, uh, prejudice. It's just because there are objects that we found that look unusual. Let's yeah. try to collect and let's be guided by evidence. Now, what the others are saying, oh, the evidence is not conclusive. Of course, it's not conclusive because we find, found it by chance. We were not even looking. <laughs> And uh, you know when Enrico Fermi said, "Where is everybody?" He was sitting in Los Alamos, didn't even look through his telescope. It's just like sitting in the sofa at home and saying, "Where are my neighbors? I don't have any neighbors." Well, to find your neighbors, you have to look through your window. And you <laughs> find your door. <laughs> and, and, and Enrico Fermi didn't. Look. So why, you know, why is this presumption, including Neil deGrasse Tyson, who said, "I will discuss it seriously when they invite me to dinner in New York City," and I say. Why do you think they are that important that they will invite you for dinner in New York City? I mean, they don't care about you. I mean, uh, when a biker uh, rides down the, uh, you know, the, the street, uh, the biker doesn't even care about uh, which crack in the pavement is occupied by a particular colony of ants. Right. So we have our own worries about, you know, national borders and so forth. They don't, you know, if there is any equipment flying by, it wouldn't even care about national borders. It's, so that's why it's a matter of science. We shouldn't think that we are so important for them to engage, you know. And, and so um, I just think that we, it's our duty to, to try and figure out what's out there, not the other way around. Well, also, well, the it's fact also that a foregone conclusion if you say it can't be. You've just made a decision without looking at the evidence, right? right That's not right. the scientific method. And the other aspect, so you can't you can't dismiss it without investigating it. So well, the other aspect I want to compliment you on, you just mentioned 1,600 interviews, and that is getting out there with uh, an open mind and, 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 and having a full spectrum, talking to everybody. The, yeah. the, that's not necessarily the common way that, <laughs> that people and that authors approach it. They're looking for the top shows with the top ratings and the top number of participants. And they're not yeah. just talking to everybody. And I really way, appreciate uh, that you're talking it, to everybody. This was uh, my uh, approach long ago, you know, when uh, I had, for example, a plumber fix, uh, we had a problem with the sewer that it was clogged at the basement, there was a flood. You know, I sat with him for a couple of hours on the stairs after we fixed it. And he was telling me about his life uh, problems and he's thinking about, and I would speak with anyone, you know. In fact, I really appreciate people that are not pretentious, as mostly young people. Uh, and to me, there is no class system in my mind. In terms, and in fact, the senior people are the ones I'm trying to avoid because they are very preoccupied with their own, as you said, politics. Like uh, Tony was mentioning the fact that SETI has a political agenda to get funded and so forth. And that's what bothers me. That's why I, I, I don't enjoy encounters with senior people. And yeah. that's why I prefer younger pe people that are not pretentious. Yeah. Here's what I appreciate about you. And um, then we have some more questions. Um, number one, your philosophy of life, really a wise, well thought out philosophy of life that informs your, your science, your approach, your, 
And the other one is to open up the timeline. You're so right about this is an archaeological dig that you're on because we can't assume that only our narrow timeline is where the action is. It could be in the past. It well, might be in tomorrow, tomorrow, in the yeah. future. So I appreciate that you've um, your philosophy is really... I should say something about that, the approach, timeline. Uh, yeah, and that it's the... all about the big questions. You talk about you're a philosopher at heart. And isn't astronomy oh, such a wonderful field to ask those big questions? One right. of which, are we alone? Yeah, so two, two points about There's that. First about, uh, first about the timeline, I wanted to mention that, you know, the sun is a late, late bloomer, so to speak, in the sense that most of the stars in the universe formed billions of years before the sun. So even if you just contemplate the same thing that happened in the solar system, just you know, uh, apply the same to another star, then most likely if there was an intelligent civilization, it existed a billion years ago. And exactly. what, what, what makes us think that Albert Einstein was the, mo the smartest scientist since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago? I think there was a smarter scientist on an exoplanet that lived a billion years ago, okay? And if that is indeed the case, the civilization who benefited from the wisdom of, of that scientist could have sent probes that would have reached us by now because a billion years is short enough to go across the Milky Way galaxy. And these uh, instruments will be equipped by artificial intelligence. They would not have any biological material on them. It's just, uh, you know, AI astronauts, what I call. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we could learn a lot from uh, finding them because uh, we could import the same technologies to, to Earth if we un understand what they're made of. So I, I see it as a learning experience where we can benefit greatly if we are only open-minded to search. Right, yeah. right. Let me go to Fred Smith, who has his hands up here. Fred is a... So yes, I'm also uh, from the professoriate I suppose, and uh, um, I'm which, going, which profession? I was a professor of Sanskrit and Indian languages and literature at the University of Iowa. I retired last year, and um, so uh, my question is um, about the molecular composition of um, this undersea object. This, I mean, you you must suspect something, and. What is it that you suspect and why, if it meets the, your suspicions, what would that tell us about anything? Or if it didn't meet your suspicions, then what would it tell us? Right. So I have two possibilities in mind. One mm. is an iron meteorite. We know that it was tougher than iron. Maybe, you know, maybe it was comparable to iron. OK, uh, so if it's an iron meteorite, we pretty much know what we might find which are tiny fragments, mostly tiny fragments, less than a millimeter in size uh, on the ocean floor, okay? And once we collect uh, a few grams of those, we can um, uh, study the composition and figure out that it's an iron meteorite, just like the iron meteorites we found from the solar system. So that's possibility number one, okay? A natural object just made of iron, even though it's 5% of all objects, it happened to be the first one the first meteor that we found from interstellar space, okay? But it came from a star that is far away. And the, as a result, the abundance of elements other than iron would be quite different than the solar system. So in this case, even then we will learn something extremely important because without even re referencing the speed by which the object is moving, I mentioned 45 kilometers per second, that was the speed when the explosion took place. It entered the atmosphere at 60 kilometers per second and it outside the solar system, it was moving even, even faster. So that's uh, twice as fast as most stars move relative to the sun. So it was moving faster than most stars, more than 95% of all stars uh, relative to the sun. Um, so uh, uh, even forgetting about that fact that it was moving fast, just from the composition of other elements, we can tell whether it came from the solar system or from outside. So that would be a vindication that indeed the government data was correct and it came from outside the solar system based on its composition. So even if we just find that it's an iron meteorite from another star, we could tell that it's not from the solar system and that would be very important scientifically. Yeah. Now that's the more boring possibility. <laughs> yes. Of course, there is also the possibility that we will not find anything which is the worst uh, nightmare. Um, but um, 
The second uh, interesting possibility is that it's uh, artificial in origin, that we would find uh, a composition that indicates that it, it's some alloy that nature doesn't produce uh, naturally. Okay, so just like uh, finding a new horizon space that we launched in the, uh, you know, fragments from it in the at the bottom of the ocean. In that case, it's possible, it's possible that um, it was, uh, it had a, a structure that protected some inner nugget of this object that uh, did not uh, disintegrate, did not uh, uh, burn up into tiny dust particles. You know, that so would be a good when, design. when an iron uh, when an iron meteorite explodes in in the atmosphere as a result of the friction with the air, uh, you end up with a dust cloud, a cloud of dust uh, particles made of molten iron. And if you were to use an umbrella, it would not protect you because these are really hot, thousands of degrees. They would make a hole in your umbrella. Uh, so imagine this rain falling on the ocean floor um, or actually falling on the ocean surface and, and creating a cloud of water vapor. That's what happens in, in that case. You have this rain of uh, molten iron droplets mm -hmm. uh, and then they land on the ocean floor. Um, but in the case of a, an artificial object, there is a, a chance that there was something, some instrument that was protected uh, by design. And uh, as a result, if we search well enough, we will find it. So imagine an iPhone 100, not iPhone 13, iPhone 14, <laughs> iPhone 100. And I would love to press a button on such a, a device. I have a follow-up question on that, though. Are we pretty sure that we know all the capabilities of alloys in the universe based on our little tiny planet here? Oh, no. So all we know... But for you to determine whether it's artificially produced means that it doesn't meet your expectations of what an alloy could be. Oh, well, we know the periodic table of ordinary matter, okay? That was known from Mendeleev's time. So we know all the elements that are stable. And, you know, since then, people try to produce in the laboratory other elements, weren't able. So we, we have a, a census of all the elements that uh, are made of ordinary matter, of neutrons, protons, and electrons. Okay, that's it. We know what they are. Now, you may say maybe there are some forms of matter that we don't know. Of course, I was talking about it before. It's called dark matter. You know, there could be forms of matter that we don't know. If dark matter was used as fuel in a device by some alien civilization, we would see nothing coming out of the exhaust because we can't see dark matter. So, but I'm saying this must be made of ordinary matter. Why do I say that? Because it exploded in the atmosphere. You know, it interacted with the atmosphere. So we know that it, it had ordinary matter in it. The question is what the relative proportions of different elements in the periodic table it had. Mm -hmm. And uh, the proportions depend on whether it was natural or artificial, because natural objects have you know, a characteristic uh, abundance pattern that is dictated by the events that produce them. Uh, we call them supernova, you know, a star. When a very massive star consumes its nuclear fuel, it collapses and uh, then uh, the envelope bounces back and, and reaches the uh, interstellar medium with heavy elements. And uh, that's called the supernova explosion. We see those explosions. We know the proportions of elements made in supernova explosions. We yeah. see that. And the solar system has uh, the abund abundance pattern of elements that you can uh, find in supernova explosions. It's very typical, okay? And then um, you find it in other stars. When you look at other stars, they have very similar abundance patterns to that of the sun. So it's very common. Now, there are some environments that have different ab abundance patterns because uh, they were enriched by different types of supernovae, different uh, uh, events. So uh, we could tell uh, different compositions. Uh, you know, even if it's natural, we can tell if an object came from the vicinity of the sun or it came from a distant star. And uh, that's what I was referring to. But mm -hmm. definitely an artificial origin would be extremely unusual compared to a supernova output in oh, terms yeah. of analysis. Yeah. It would be because when you make an artificial device like a spacecraft, you're selecting the elements you want to make it with. You can make it completely out of aluminum. Nature would never do that. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. All right, Fred. Thank you. Okay, next question here. Uh, let me see. It says Elizabeth, but I think it's Elizabeth's husband. <laughs> we'll see what happens here. Hello. Turn on hey your mic. There you are. It is Elizabeth's husband. Hi, I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. Uh, I have, uh, I don't know, a little weird piece of information for you that I've never been able to tell anyone else who's interested in this kind of stuff. But it, um, so back in the 60s, my father was studying electrical engineering in Denver. Um, and he came up, that's when like, there was a bunch of UFOs over the White House, all that kind of crazy stuff was going on. So he got really excited about how things could move without any propulsion and change direction in, in the atmosphere. Um, and so he came up with this little proof that he thought should work just with, with uh, electrical uh, magnetic propulsion. Um, and his wife at the time uh, worked at Martin Missiles outside of Denver. And uh, she's like, well, why don't you run it by the engineers? So he's like, okay. So he came to pick her up at work and she had him talk to the engineers. And they said, we really like this idea. You're right, there's no reason this sh shouldn't work. So uh, he'd, they'd sneak him onto the base where he'd, he'd uh, come to pick up his wife and she'd take the car and leave and he'd stay there. And he worked with the engineers and uh, they eventually made it. And, and that's where they were testing the, uh, the thrusters for uh, the, the new intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles, yeah. These are the, the, the huge old ones, and they're making the new, newer, uh, more efficient ones. Um, so they made a giant, the, the problem with it was it took so much energy to get it to lift. Um, and also the whole thing had to move and you were in the d age of diodes pretty much then. So, so there was no way to control it. So like, all we can do is launch it just to see that it works. And, and so they built this huge thing and they launched it and then they're like, okay, we're done talking to you now. <laughs> and, oh. uh, and it's in our hands. Bye. And, and, but they let him come to watch him launch it. So, so this, this, uh, idea of, of a, I was just thinking of, of your small, that idea of that small craft, the idea that he was talking about with the engineers was they, if they could uh, control it, which we could easily do, not easily, but we could do now, but some other race I'm sure could do much better than we could <laughs> like a, but anyway, you could, you could make it where it can pull towards a mass and then it can slingshot off of that mass. So it's kind of like the what Star Trek where they go find the whale and they go back in time by slingshotting around the sun kind of idea. But eventually it starts to, this small object through its propulsion, it's like a magnetic field eventually, and it starts to fold space because it's moving so fast was their idea. I, I don't know if, it, if that makes any sense, um, but... Uh, um, it, it can start to leapfrog through deeper space because it's starting to like almost fold space around it with that what is deep space idea kind of dark matter. I think what you're getting at is there are laws of nature, there's laws of physics, we don't know them all. Yeah, yeah. And so and... these guys were really interested in all those questions. Um, and they're like, we're, it's going to take a while to get this now past this point where we launch it. But he said it was insane at the launch. It was like, a, it was like watching the space shuttle go up, the amount of force it took. Um, I, I what did they do? That... Where did this te technology go once they took it out of his hand? Yeah. Awesome. When, I, uh, when I started the, to work in, uh, in physics, when I did my PhD, um, uh, I, I worked on a project funded by the US government at the time, and it was using electric uh, energy for propulsion. Um, so I actually have a patent on that. And that's what brought me to the US. That And uh, as a result of that, I'm an astrophysicist now at Harvard. Um, so I'm very familiar with the various concepts, advanced concepts that were de uh, developed for propulsion. But uh, obviously, I guess the point that you're making is 
if we do find a, a device from another civilization that is far more advanced than we are, that represents our future, we could learn how to employ it. And by no means do we have the most sophisticated uh, propulsion systems right now. There are, there, there are lots of technologies that we haven't yet realized. So that's a, a great uh, reason uh, for us to explore and figure, and we shouldn't assume. Uh, now, what we can do is, uh, by looking at objects in the sky, if any of them behaves in ways that we cannot reproduce with current technologies, that would be a clean signature that it doesn't belong to an adversary, you know, because we pretty much know what the J Chinese and the, the Russians are able to do, and, um, and as well as what we can do. So, um, so one way to figure out if something is unusual is to see that it maneuvers in ways that are quite uh, unusual. Now, I expect that uh, uh, that any such equipment will not get guidance from the senders because the distances are vast. You know, across the Milky Way galaxy, it takes tens of thousands of years for any signal to to grow, go a, a, across interstellar space. So there is no way by which uh, a probe would wait for guidance from the sender. It has to be autonomous, and obviously, it has to be equipped with artificial intelligence to pursue its own goals on a, an autonomous on basis. And, and, yeah, and we just need to figure out what these goals are, what, how this instrument operates. But, but um, you know, we might need to use our own AI system, artificial intelligence systems to figure out their AI systems because they would feel some kinship. You know, the, our AI systems would feel closer to their AI systems than, than to us, actually. Uh, because, <laughs> Considering as well, uh, for an, I mean, for for the Earth to encounter something that's within our solar system, spinning around all the dust and debris and basketball-sized stuff, that that's not much of a stretch. But for an interstellar object, for that to encounter the Earth and for us to see it is like you were saying, is one in a thousand. But it seems like that 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 it's so remote. That, that the idea of it being a chance becomes almost obsolete. And, and you'd think that, uh, like you were saying, if there's an AI, and if you could launch that, put an artificial intelligence on it that's smart enough to go, oh, I'm looking for a certain kind of thing out in deep space. And it starts altering, it starts finding those kinds of things, and then it goes there, then, then wouldn't we be a likely target? We're emanating all sorts yeah. of. Yeah. Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it have like? It's, yeah. It, it seemed like it would be a very smart way to question. Yeah. No, no, what well, sure well, questions you're, you're posing, Dan? Thank that you. Would, yeah. Would yeah. provide. And and one thing to keep in mind is uh, if you go to the beach, uh, try to do that. Uh, you will find many more rocks that are natural than plastic bottles out there. Right. There you go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Dan. You said something intriguing. You've been talking about the dark matter and dark energy and how it's different, non-ordinary matter and energy. We're ordinary from our perspective. Uh, we can't see it because we don't have the bandwidth of d detection um, technologically as well as biologically. But can, are we able ever, given that we're made of ordinary matter, maybe we are made of some non-ordinary matter, I don't know, um, to develop technology that can detect it? Or is that oh, just, yeah, that, uh, okay. so what's that's it going to take to do so? The hope that we can do that um, allowed scientists to get funding at the level of billions of dollars. Most recently, uh, with the Large Hadron Collider, we smashed particles that yeah. we are familiar with against each other in an attempt to produce dark matter. We, okay. you know, just like uh, kids smash things to see what comes out, we smashed at the highest energies possible particles in the Large Hadron Collider, it cost us $10 billion. And the motivation was maybe we will produce the lightest supersymmetric mm -hmm. particle that may make the dark matter. That was the, the reasoning. And everyone said, yeah, supersymmetry, that's it. That's the dark matter. And I, since I started astrophysics for decades, the, everyone was saying that's the most natural thing. We should invest billions of dollars in looking for it. The $10 billion were put forward, nobody said ex this is an extraordinary claim that requires, you know, extraordinary. Really they just said, yeah, sure, supersymmetric particles. In fact, 
uh, it was even, I mean, string theory was founded on supersymmetry. Uh, they assumed that it must be right and then built uh, this tower of string theory on top of the, this foundation that was never proven right. Now, the Large Hadron Collider looked for supersymmetry, looked for these dark matter particles, didn't find them. Now, nobody said, oh, we were wrong. We should take back all the prizes that were awarded to people who suggested supersymmetry in this parameter space. Yeah. Uh, we, nobody said that. So, okay, well, that's part of science. Investing $10 billion, not finding what we're seeking. Sure, it's part of science. But when we say 1% of this funding of $10 billion should be allocated to the search for objects that are unusual, that we already know exist, so the Galileo project just needs at most $100 million, which is 1% of the budget of the Large Hadron Collider or the James Webb Space Telescope. Then people say, well, we are not sure that it's worth spending that money. And the government comes forward and says, we want to figure it out. The public says, we want to figure it out. So usually science uh, um, allocation uh, funding, uh, funding committees from uh, uh, federal agencies, they are occupied by mainstream scientists and they often say, we should be careful at the way we allocate funds because we don't want to waste taxpayers' money, okay? Now I say, these are the taxpayers. They want us to find the answer to Listen that. Listen to us, yeah. yeah. And yet those committees do not allocate, you know, nothing to the search for objects. Well, it would from- make sense to go ask that Einstein from the extraterrestrial um, billion-year-old <laughs> civilization to learn yeah. their secrets. They figured it out. If they got something here, they've awfully figured something out that we yeah, should. But well, yeah. What bothers me is that um, humans have this tendency of remaining ignorant. And I just don't understand that. Why would the philosophers at the time of Galileo not look through his telescope? <laughs> well, of course, uh, Tony would say, oh, just like the SETI community. Back then, these were people that had affiliation with the church and the church was claiming we are at the center of the universe. So they had their own politics in order to maintain their funding from people contributing to the church. They had to maintain the view that we are at the center of the universe. Therefore, they didn't want to look through the telescope. That all makes sense in, in, in the context of that politics, but it doesn't make sense in the context of expanding our knowledge, the island of knowledge, in the sense that nowadays, you know, there are billions of dollars allocated to space. And you know, if we had the wrong view about space, we would get nowhere. If we were to listen to those philosophers, we would get nowhere. All the advances we have in, in terms of telecommunication, as, as satellites in space, that came from We'd be back in the uh, realizing that Galileo was right. The guy that was left alone in his home that nobody wanted uh, him to be heard uh, yeah. He was right, and we are now basing a whole eco- economy on that. So I'm saying, why would we repeat the same mistake over and over again now that we learned the lesson? Why wouldn't we invest 1% of the budget allocated for the search for dark matter? 1% of that in the search for... And then the SETI community comes back and says to me, no, 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 you shouldn't discuss that. They, they were quite generous with us. And in fact, we yeah. shouldn't bring this point up. I have, I have to say that yeah. the founder of our institute, a woman, a woman right. scientist, uh, was quite daring, asked intriguing questions, went her own way. Um, we have a saying, well, we, we appreciate the saying, well-behaved women don't make history. Rarely make history. Rarely make history. Right. Yeah. And I have to say that... Um, Galileo's who we still celebrate today, right? We don't know the church fathers that was putting them under house so arrest. Well, we don't know them. So, it is, so, so you I want to ask well, you, well because we have to, we have to wrap it up, because I know you have another uh, commitment, one of many uh, other interviews. We have to say, what do you want your legacy to be, Avi? Oh, um, 100 maybe, years from now, when, when people look back on this era, who we is finally that? did this breakthrough, <laughs> we finally answered the question, are we alone? What do you want your legacy to be? Well, two things. One, that... Um, archaeology of objects in space that came from dead civilizations that may be equipped with artificial intelligence. That is a frontier of mainstream science. I really hope that will be the case, you know, after yeah. long after I die. But the more important principle that I want future generations to be guided by is maintain your childhood curiosity. Yeah. Meaning, don't pretend you know more than you actually know. Be guided by evidence. You know, children want to examine reality, to touch it, they get bruised very often because they are wrong. I mean, being wrong is part of a learning experience. So using this principle, 
of being guided by evidence and willing to make mistakes, but asking daring questions in order to expand our knowledge rather than trying to be liked by others, trying to pretend that we are experts so that we can get more honors and awards, you know, which is pr pretty much the guiding principle of academia these days, yeah. uh, is, uh, I think, uh, suppressing progress. Uh, I, I'm not against it just because, uh, because I, you know, I, I'm jealous that people get prizes and awards and so That's not at all the issue. The issue is that when experts uh, say we don't have anything new on the horizon <laughs> because they want to maintain their status, that suppresses the progress of science. They're just like those philosophers during the days. Of, and that's the lesson that we should learn over and over again, that, uh, that nature is trying to educate us. Let's be humble and listen, you know, learn from, and the way to learn something new is from evidence. It's not by listening to other people on Twitter. <laughs> that's not the way to learn. I mean, that may work in politics. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, I mean, obviously, that's why politics is so polarized because people can hold opposite views and have their own crowds, their bubble, you know, uh, where everyone else agrees with them. The thing about nature is that you can look for evidence that would arbitrate, that would serve the role of uh, telling us what the truth is rather than people. Follow where the evidence leads. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, whatever um, that may be. Well, um, Tony had his hand up. One yeah. quick comment, Tony, and we celebrate you and Diana coming up about the James Webb and its images here on August 21st. Yeah. We appreciate yeah, we'll just, that. One, one, um, one, one minute quick left. comment. Uh, yeah. Hey, okay, just um, it strikes me that there ought to be all sorts of funding sources. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have looked uh, exhaustively at these or if they come to you. Uh, but, uh, you know, I can think of... Uh, foundations that have supported me in, in some of my endeavors. Uh, one of them was the Beringer Foundation that runs Meteor Crater and, and okay. has other assets. And I think they fund, uh, they fund uh, uh, a professorship at Caltech and other things like that. Yeah, uh, so I, I should say uh, I was approached uh, a month ago by the Brinson Foundation, and yeah. they told me that they are inspired by uh, the vision of the Galileo Project. So they are funding now uh, a postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, that's an example. I did not approach them. They approached me. But if you can email me um, any other ideas you have, I would appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll put yeah. you two in touch. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Tony. Yeah. And, and a quick question. Uh, you, we talked a little bit about LSST, the, the Rubin Telescope. Uh, the data is supposed to be open to that. Will this be useful to you? And oh, you, yeah. have a, you have a channel for using that. So first, the, the Webb Telescope, I wanted to mention that, you know, a, a couple of days ago, I was asked by the Smithsonian Magazine, there was a question by someone from the general public, how would it be useful to find evidence for extraterrestrial intelligent civilizations? And I gave three possibilities. One, if there is an object like Oumuamua that comes close to Earth, the Webb Telescope is a million miles away from Earth. So we look at that object from two directions, the direction of Earth ah. and the direction of the Webb. And therefore, we can pin down the three-dimensional trajectory of that object extremely precisely. So we can tell whether there is any propulsion in addition to the force of gravity acting on it. That's something we didn't have with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. It was very close to Earth. Uh, the second is, of course, the Webb Telescope can look at the composition of the object. The, the other thing that the Webb Telescope can do is look for, for example, artificial lights, city lights, on the night side of a planet uh, in the habitable zone of another star. For example, the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, has two habitable planets. And imagine looking at the night side of one of them, mm -hmm. and they are tidally locked, so they have a permanent night side, and seeing city lights. You know, that would be obviously a signature of yeah. a civilization. The third thing is looking uh, for planets that transit in front of their parent star and finding industrial pollution in the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. I, I wrote papers on all, all, all of these possibilities. Um, yeah. So that's with the Webb Telescope. LSST, of course, is interesting in the sense of finding objects, uh, for example, that enter the solar system, interstellar objects. That would be a fantastic survey. We are working now on how to extract uh, those objects from the pipeline of data. Uh, and uh, uh, you would be surprised to know that uh, when I contacted one of the people involved, he told me, uh, I asked him, are you 
uh, flagging objects that came from outside the solar system when you search. And he said, no, no, we just make an assumption that all objects are within the solar, all objects that are like oh, uh, asteroids or, or, or comets are following an orbit that is bound to the sun. And I said, why would you assume that? He said, well, well that's, the way, that's, that's the way it is. So I, yeah, I you yeah. know, it's, it's yeah. just that it shows you that very often astronomers put blinders. They right. assume something. They don't even look for something else. Well, let me, let me, let me say that, that they are creating tools that, that would be very easy to use. And yeah, be... I mean, uh, one thing I learned in life that asking, like asking the government to declassify data or asking other people to do the work, you know, it's not the most efficient way to get. Right. right. And so I just, do it yourself. I, I just, I will just do it myself. Yeah. Well, thank well, you yeah. Tony. so much, Tony. We're yeah. out of time here. But, We're out of time because um, we promised uh, Avi could be on, yeah. end on time. Avi, you've done it again. You have given us so much energy and insight yeah. and uh, your, your perspective. And uh, you as a, as a person that um, is a leading edge scientist, bringing science down to the level that all of us can enjoy being part of that journey and not making it some exclusive club that we can't follow. That you, you're making it the every, the every man's world uh, opportunity for us to, to be a part of. Making so, it exciting, making it accessible, yeah. making it logical. I, it's fun to be in your orbit, sir. It's nice. <laughs> the Thank you so much. Uh, and, and the reason is simple. You know, I, I came into science uh, by chance. I was interested in philosophy and circumstances brought me in. I don't think of myself as special, as unusual. And therefore, I try to explain what I understand. That's all. Ah, thank you, yeah. Avi. Thank you and good luck. It was fun to get the update from you. Congratulations on all that you've accomplished with this. And uh, bringing in we look the next forward to more. We're yeah. going to keep track of this project. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's really been fun. Just, right. uh, we applaud just, you and everything that you you are doing and that you're accomplishing and that you will do.